Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This is the eighth video in the series on Smith charts and the third of the how-to part of the series. In the last two videos, I did a paper and pencil exercise to design two different hypothetical stub matches. A series stub match with a shorted stub and a parallel stub match with an open stub. In this video of the series, I'm going to design and implement a real-life parallel stub match with a shorted stub. Now, as a demonstration, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the actual design process, as I have covered this in the previous videos in rather significant detail. This one here is aimed at the practical aspects of creating the stub match. The design frequency will be 100 megahertz. I will prefer a shorted stub because shorted stubs radiate less. But if the open stub is shorter, well, I guess I'll take that. But we'll see how it all shakes out. Now, the subject of this match is a load that I created purposely to be a bad load. It is constructed from a UHF female or SO239 connector and a UHF to N adapter and many, many times ancient 33 ohm resistor carbon composition, which don't have the best RF characteristics. And then a little bit of a, an inductor that I wound out of some old solid uh, telephone wire. Now, it just so happens, not by design, by the way, that this load has almost exactly a 5 to 1 SWR at 100 megahertz, which is our target frequency. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. Now, let's begin the process of designing our stub match. So let's begin the demonstration of how to create a parallel stub match to match a perfectly horrible load. The first and most important step is to measure the impedance accurately. You, you have to measure the actual impedance of the load, which means that you need to use a properly calibrated VNA, like a nano VNA or a mini VNA tiny. Maybe you have uh, a higher end VNA available to you or a reliable and accurate antenna analyzer. And remember, it must be done right at the load's connector, any distance at all away from the load, whether it be an adapter or a small piece of coax or a long piece of coax, is going to make a difference in the measured impedance. Now, I measured my purposely mismatched load at 100 megahertz using my VNA, and I got an impedance of 65.69 plus J103.68. I decided, well, you know, I do say a reliable and accurate antenna analyzer. So I broke out my older MFJ259C antenna analyzer and measured it using exactly the same kind of a method and ended up with an impedance measured of 202 plus J83. So I chose to use the value I got from my VNA and I sent my MFJ259C in for calibration. Now, know your coax is step number two. I am choosing to use some old Comscope RG58AU that I had laying around. I got a reel of it from somewhere, so I use it for all these experimental projects. Now, it has a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, but what about its velocity factor? The data sheet says 66%. Well, let's measure it and see what it really is. We want to set our VNA to display phase. And then we do a sweep across various frequencies with our piece of test coax in place, looking for the lowest possible frequency where we get this transition from minus 180 degrees to plus 180 degrees. We look for the second one over here where we go from minus 180 to plus 180. This is the quarter wavelength. Our coax is one quarter wavelength long, electrically speaking. This is the three quarters wavelength. 
And this is the one that we're interested in. So what we're going to do then is we're going to zoom in on this spot so that this is what we see on the screen. Be careful when you zoom in that you don't zoom in too closely because when you do the calibration, this frequency that this shift occurs will move on you. And so now we're going to go and do our calibration. I've accomplished my calibration and I've moved my markers to the bottom and the top because you can't get the marker to sit right, right there where you want it. So you get the bottom and the top and we're going to just average these two numbers to give us the frequency that is in the middle between the two. Well, having measured the three-quarter wavelength frequency of my test coax, I'm ready to calculate what the velocity factor of my coax is. Now, I carefully measured the physical length of my test coax to be 12.6 inches long from reference plane to reference plane on the piece of coax. The three-quarter wavelength frequency of my test coax came out to be 450.63 megahertz as determined by my VNA. So we stick it into this lovely formula. Velocity factor is equal to the physical length of the coax in inches times the frequency of the three-quarter wavelength coax as measured divided by 0.75 times the speed of light in inches per second. This gives me a velocity factor of 64%. So I'm ready to proceed. Now let's bring everything into one place, just so that we remind ourselves of all the details. The frequency of interest for our design is going to be 100 megahertz. Our load impedance, as measured by the VNA, is 65.69 plus J103.68. That gives us a calculated SWR of 5.15 to 1. I'm going to be using some coax that has a measured velocity factor of 64% with a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. So the very first thing that we have to do when we start designing our stub match is to normalize the impedance, which is the impedance divided by the characteristic impedance. So our normalized impedance is 1.314 plus J2.074. Now we get to plot this on the Smith chart. So the first thing we do is we locate the R equals 1.314 circle. You say, my goodness, how are you going to do that? Well, you'll hear me talking an awful lot in this about using a calibrated eyeball, which is exactly what we do. We come over here to 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. We know 1.35 is somewhere here in the middle. And we kind of carefully look, carefully look in this area and determine, well, that kind of sort of kind of looks like a 1.314. And so we have our 1.314 circle. The next thing, we have to locate the plus J2.074 circle. The plus tells us we're on the northern hemisphere up here. And again, we break out our calibrated eyeball to locate this. And our pretty blue line here is exactly that. Then we place a dot on the spot where the two cross. Next, we're going to have to draw our SWR circle. Again, the SWR remains constant, but the composition of the impedance changes as you move around the circle. Finally, we want to convert this into the admittance realm. And the reason why we do that is because this is a parallel stub match. And it's a whole lot easier to work in admittances than it is to work in impedances when you're dealing with parallel stub matches or impedances in parallel. So to do this, we simply draw a line starting at our impedance through the center of the Smith chart, past the SWR circle all the way to the other side over here. And then we're going to place a dot where that line crosses our SWR circle. 
this is the, ad the admittance value for this impedance. And so we go in and again, using our calibrated eyeballs, we determine what the admittance value is. It's equal to 0 0.219 minus J 0 0.34. Now we need to locate this admittance in the wavelength realm. In the wavelength realm, it is equal to 0 0.4453. Again, our calibrated eyeballs as we look at this outer ring here and determine exactly what that is. So now that we know where this admittance lay in the wavelength realm, we can begin the process of designing our match. Now we're moving from the bad load, which is sitting down here, to a good load, which is going to reside up here. So we're going to be moving toward the generator from the load through our admittance transforming piece of coax all the way to the G equals one circle. Because at G equals one, the real part of the admittance is exactly what we want. This would, if that's all we had was G equals one, we'd have a one-to-one -one SWR. So we're going to be moving around clockwise to this point right up here. And then we place a dot right on that location. This is the new admittance. This is point A, where we have the real part exactly what we want. But the problem is, as you can see here, we have a reactive part that is maintaining this SWR that we don't want. Now, let's note the new admittance at this point right here. Again, we do our calibrated eyeball. It kind of looks like it's a plus J1.82 because we're in the northern hemisphere and it's right there on that spot. Next, we're going to draw a line through this from the center through our new admittance at A to the edge so that we can locate this admittance in the wavelength realm. And again, using our calibrated eyeball, we look along the edge here, we got 0 0.18 three, five in the wavelength realm. Now we have to find out what the distance is in between these two points are so that we can calculate the length of our coax. So we know at this point that the wavelength at the load is 0 0.4453 wavelengths. And the wavelength position at A is equal to 0 0.1835 wavelengths. Let's calculate the length of the admittance transforming piece of coax. Well, in terms of wavelengths, we crossed the lambda equals 0, 0.0 point at the far left-hand side of the Smith chart. So we have to use the bigger formula here and calculate it in two pieces. The first piece right over here is the distance between lambda sub load and that lambda 0, 0.0. Remember, 0, 0.0 and 0, 0.5 share the same spot on the Smith chart. And then the second piece is the distance between 0, 0 and our new admittance at A. Total length of our coax in wavelengths of 0, 0.2382 wavelengths. But you know, you can't cut coax in wavelengths. You have to know inches or feet or meters or millimeters or something. And we're going to calculate this in terms of inches. To do that, we know, first of all, the length has to be 0 0.2382. This is the electrical length of the coax in wavelengths. And we have that here. We have the speed of light in inches per second. We have the velocity factor of our coax. And we have the frequency of interest down here. And so the length of this admittance transforming coax is 18129 inches. Now we can turn our attention to the stub. Here is our admittance at A, 1 plus J 1.82. What we need at this point is 1 plus J 0, 0, because that will give us a 1 to 1 SWR. Now, as you recall, when you have admittances in parallel, the total admittance 
is equal to the sum of the constituting admittances. So y1 plus y2 plus y3 and so on. So suppose that the admittance of the stub were to be equal to 0 minus j1.82. This we know as 1 plus j1.82. Then we would have 1 plus j1.82 plus 0 minus j1.82. 1 plus 0 is 1, plus j1.82, minus j1.82 gives us a 0. That's exactly what we want. So let's plot this admittance right here on our Smith chart. Going to the Smith chart, we remember that this outside ring here is the g equals zero ring, which is what we want here. We see the minus, which tells us we're in this southern hemisphere. And so we get out our calibrated eyeballs again, and we find the point where we have a reactive portion of 1.82 along the edge of the Smith chart. And then we place a dot on that. We draw the line from the center all the way through to the edge over here. And now we can read the position of this admittance in the wavelength realm. Again, using our calibrated eyeball and looking at this spot, we can see lambda sub stub is equal to 0 0.3295. If we're going to use a shorted stub, and we're standing at the end of this shorted stub and moving toward point A, we're moving toward the generator, so we are going to be moving clockwise around the Smith chart. If we are using a, an open stub, that point is over here, and we would be still moving clockwise around, but notice how much further we have to go to get to this point if we were using an open stub. So that piece of coax would be much longer. So let, we're going to choose a shorted stub because we want a nice short piece of coax. So we'll move from the short, which is lambda equal to 0 0.25, to the position of the stub down here, lambda equal to 0 0.3295. So with the lambda sub stub equal to 0 0.3295 wavelengths and the lambda sub short equal to 0 0.25 wavelengths, we can calculate the length of our stub coax, which eliminates the reactive portion of the admittance at A. First, we do it in wavelengths. Now, we didn't cross the lambda 0, 0.0 place on the Smith chart. So we can use the very simple equation here. The length of the coax in wavelengths is equal to lambda sub stub minus lambda sub short gives us a length of our stub in terms of wavelengths of 0 0.0795. But like before, we can't measure things in wavelengths. We need inches. So let's calculate it in inches. Well, the formula is exactly the same. The only difference is lambda sub coax is different. And so this number changes. We do the math, and we come up with a stub that is approximately 6.00 inches long. Now we are ready to build our stub match. We have determined that the length of the transforming coax is going to be 18.129 inches, about 18 and an eighth inches long. And the length of the stub is going to be six inches. Now I'm going to be using a BNC all-female T for my joining spot. So I'm going to connect my stub up to here. I'll connect up my transforming coax over here. And then I'll have a piece of coax here that goes off to my generator or my VNA to measure the results. Now understand that the velocity factor of these connectors and the connectors that you have on the end of your coax isn't the same as the coax itself necessarily. So this is going to make a difference in the final length of your coax. Be prepared to make some adjustments in the length of your coax. Now we can begin the process of building our stub match. 
As I said before, I'm going to use a BNC T, female, 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 as the place where everything meets, which means that the end of my impedance transforming piece of coax has to have a BNC connector on it, as does the end of my stub have a BNC connector on it. One of the important things to remember is that the the length of your coax is not from the end of the connector here to the end of the connector here. It is from the reference plane of the connector, which, as you look down in here, is right about where that orange colored stuff is down inside of there. That is because that corresponds to this spot right here on the connector, on its mating connector, which is the reference plane. So what that means is that you have to do a little bit of calculation to figure out how long the coax has to be so that your reference planes end up in the right places. Another important point to remember when you're measuring your coax is that the place where things meet is here right here at this point, right right here. It's not back here, you're not measuring this. You, you need to know the length of your coax right to this point. So your coax itself is actually going to be a little shorter because of the distance between the end of the coax that's actually inside this connector to this point. So your length of your coax is from this point all the way down to the other end to where the reference plane of this connector is at. Another trick that I learned, don't measure from the end of your measuring stick. I like to start at the 10 and then measure all the way up to where you want to be. And the same thing here for our, our stub. This is the meeting point here. So you have to take in consideration the distance from here to the end of your coax here. The, the coax of your stub is actually going to be a bit shorter because you have the additional distance from inside the connector to this meeting point right here. If you're making a shorted stub like we are here, measure your coax about an eighth of an inch longer than you need it. Then strip back the outer insulation one eighth of an inch like I show you here. Then fold back the shield and cut the, in, the center insulation away as I did here. Dip the center conductor in a little bit of soldering flux and then fold the shield back over top of that center. Dip the end in just a little bit more flux and then using your soldering iron add your solder to solder the center to the shield. You don't want to use too much solder but in the end it should look something like this. And then you can trim the end just a little bit as necessary to kind of neatenize it. With an open stub it's a lot easier. You just clip off the end, but carefully inspect the end of your coax to make sure that there aren't any little hairs of shield shorting in between the two. So the completed stub match, including the perfectly awful load that we have here, through the admittance transforming coax to the T. Here is our shorted stub. And then this is just a piece of coax to a termination so I can connect it up to my vector network analyzer and see how it performs. Now we get to look at the final results of our initial stab at this. And they're pretty good. I mean, really, you look at the SWR curve and it's centered pretty much right over the 100 megahertz right where we want it. 
We have an SWR of 1.15 to 1, which is very respectable. But I wanted to do a little bit better for you than that. And so I wanted to go out and make some adjustments. The length of the admittance transforming coax was probably just a shade long. So I thought I would trim off just a quarter of an inch. Yes, just a quarter of an inch. It's not very much. But at these frequencies, a quarter of an inch makes a significant difference. And that did improve the SWR, but it also moved the sweet spot north of 100 megahertz. So I thought, okay, I need to adjust the length of the stub too. Maybe I need to shorten it one quarter of an inch too. So I did that and discovered, nope, that was the wrong way to go. The stub didn't need to get shorter. It actually needed to get longer. So I had to create a new stub. I couldn't use a cable stretcher to make it longer. And so I created a new stub that was a half an inch longer, knowing that it was easier to trim the stub than it was to try to make it longer. So what are the results? Having made the stub a half an inch longer, and the transforming portion of the coax a quarter of an inch shorter. Well, here, look at, take a look at this. Okay, my sweet spot here is just a little bit south of the 100 megahertz. It's not exactly where I would have wanted it. It's 150 kilohertz below it. But look at the SWR, it's a 1.02 to 1 at that point. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to use this in a radio application where I'm not necessarily going to be stuck at a very specific frequency, I'd like to kind of know where its performance is good over a wider band of frequencies. So I looked at where the SWR crossed 1.5 to 1 from below the sweet spot frequency to above the sweet spot frequency. The difference between these two is 7.55 megahertz, which is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. So I would say that at this point, this stub match is a success. Well, we have successfully designed and built a stub match to provide nearly a one-to-one -one SWR at 100 megahertz for our purposely poor load. In the next video, I will be designing and implementing a stub match to convert the impedance of a VHF folded dipole to that of my 50 ohm feed line. It will be centered around a frequency in the middle of the amateur radio 2 meter band, 146 megahertz. If you have found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Until next time, thanks so much for watching. Toodaloots.